Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. For Easter I thought I'd do something similar to what I did for Christmas and read the Easter story from the Bible and give my perspective on it. I'm going to start by addressing some of the problems that came up on my Christmas video. First I'm going to just make it clear right here. I am not a biblical scholar, not by any stretch of the imagination. I will probably make mistakes that are based on the fact that I don't have a complete understanding of the original language that the books were written in, nor do I know much about the culture at the time. That being said, I believe, though I know this is not a universal opinion among Christians, that if an all-powerful God wanted to get a message across to us in the form of a book, he would be able to do it in a way that would not depend entirely on my understanding a certain language or being completely knowledgeable about a customs of a time. It should be universal, simple, and plain. So in my opinion, if you need to understand an ancient language to get God's message right, then God is a shit messenger. So now, here's how I'm planning on doing this. I'm going to read the books in the order that it is mostly agreed upon that they were written, so I'm going to start with Mark, then on to Luke, Matthew, and finally John. It's a long story, so I'm going to break it into five chunks. I'm going to start with The Last Supper, then move on to Gethsemane, The Trial, The Crucifixion, and The Resurrection. Hopefully I'll be able to get through all of them in the next couple weeks, but if not, there is always next Easter to finish it. So enough with the mumbo-jumbo, let's get on to the Bible. All right, so starting in the book of Mark, chapter 14, Jesus anointed at Bethany. I'm including this as part of the Last Supper uh, section. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him, but not during the feast, they said, or the people will riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at a table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured perfume on his head. But well, that's kind of rude. I mean, she should have asked first. She might be, he might be someone like me. I, I despise the vast majority of perfume scents. I have a very sensitive sense of smell. So perfumes and I just do not get along. So, you know, if Jesus is like me, then... That's like, I wouldn't be happy about that if somebody just broke an entire jar of perfume over me. It's like, oh, now I got to go, you know, take like 15 showers to get that off. And then, you know, this is back in the, back in the year 33 or whatever. I don't think they had uh, indoor plumbing quite as easily. So the idea of washing off the perfume, although then again, because they didn't have indoor plumbing, maybe they just used the perfume instead of washing. So yeah, there might be something to be said for that. Anywho, on to verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. I agree with that. If you have perfume that's worth more than a year's wages, sell that shit. Like, perfume is not that good. It doesn't matter what it smells like. It's just perfume. Like, sell that crap. It isn't like year's wages for a jar of perfume that's disgusting verse six leave her alone said jesus why are you bothering her she has done a beautiful thing to me well i guess he likes the perfume then the poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want but you will not always have me this is a verse that uh, a lot of people use as an excuse to uh, you know indulge themselves in buying a mansion before uh, giving money to charity or whatever, like, you know, the, the poor will be here always. So, you know, I have some, I have time to take care of myself and then take care of the poor later. And, you know, I, I get like, I live in, yeah, I wouldn't call it a nice house, but it's not a bad house, you know, in a decent area. It's, and, uh, you know, I, I make a decent amount of money and I, probably could give like uh, if if we lived a lot more frugally and didn't have anywhere near the amount of creature comforts that we do we could give a lot more money to the poor um and if i were a christian who is told repeatedly in this book to sell everything you have and give all that money to the poor um that it's a very appealing verse to say oh the the poor will be here always so this is Jesus saying that you can take care of yourself for a bit but no that's not actually what he's saying he's saying you'll have the poor always you won't always have me which 
Come to think of it, that's actually directly contradictory to the whole resurrection thing. Like, didn't he come back from the dead and he's supposedly still alive today and everybody has Jesus with them in their hearts? I mean, this is Mark we're talking about, so this is the earliest gospel. It is the very least supernatural Jesus. The resurrection story wasn't, like, half of it, more than half of it, wasn't even included in uh, some of the older manuscripts of Mark. That was something that was added on later. Uh, let's see, the resurrection. Um, yeah, there, there actually is no uh, resurrection. It's just uh, an empty tomb. Like, at, at the end of Mark... Um, not including chapter 16 verses nine through, uh, through 20, uh, nine through 20 are the ones where Jesus actually comes back and says stuff, uh, chapter 16 verse eight. Well, we'll get there, but it, it like the book of Mark originally ended with no resurrection. It was just an empty tomb. So th this is the least supernatural Jesus. And he says, you will not always have me, which is in direct contradiction with, with all the other stuff that says that Jesus is with you always. Uh, so anyway, on to verse eight, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Doesn't say anything about motivation, uh, doesn't say anything, it's just basically Judas suddenly decided to betray Jesus. Uh, it was, seems a bit odd. But anyway, on to the Lord's Supper, verse 12. We're still in chapter 14. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, remember that's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We'll get back to that. When it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations to eat, uh, for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I might eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things uh, just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. That's, that, that reminds me of the, uh, the story of the little red hen where she's trying to make some bread and she keeps asking people for help. And, you know, not I, said the pig. Not I, said the cat. Not I, said the duck. Not I, said the... <sighs> Crap, I forget what the other animal was, but the fourth animal. I mean, you know, sorry for excluding you, fourth animal. I forget which one you are. But it, could, could you picture that? Like 12 guys sitting around a table going, surely not I. Surely not I. Surely not I. Surely not I! I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. And so on and so forth. Like, that's... I I hope people see that as a literary device, because if that was meant to be taken literally, that just paints a completely goofy picture. On to verse 20. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. I struggled with this verse when I was a Christian because the way I saw it, Judas basically made it possible for humanity to be saved. Like He made God's plan possible. God couldn't have done it without Judas. I mean, he's God, he's all-powerful, supposedly he could do anything anyway, in which case, why the hell would he choose human sacrifice as the way to forgive mankind? Why couldn't he just, you know, forgive mankind? Um, but, you know, if he chose to do it with the human sacrifice and he needed the guy to be betrayed, you know, that's, that's, putting, a lot of, that's putting a lot of blame on Judas. Like, this, this is God's plan. God's plan required Judas to do that, and then now God is punishing him with an eternity of torture for doing what was necessary and what saved, supposedly saved uh, well, millions and millions of souls. It, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Verse 22, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Well, that's a little creepy, Jesus. This is your body? Okay, whatever. You, you pretend that's your body. I'll go ahead and eat my bread. 
Verse 23, Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Oh my god, he didn't tell them it was his blood until after they drank it. How sick is that? That's disgusting, Jesus. Like, come on, man. Have some decency. Maybe somebody didn't want to drink the blood. Maybe... Maybe one of them knew what AIDS was way back then and you know, didn't want to risk it. Or, well, I suppose AIDS didn't even exist back then. Ah, syphilis. You can get syphilis through blood. He didn't want your syphilis, Jesus. He doesn't know where you've been. You hang around with hookers all the time. <sighs> That's sick, Jesus. Also, i uh, like to mention, this is my blood of the covenant. There's a superscript H there, which if I go down, it says, Some manuscripts read the new as in the new covenant. So that looks to me like uh, it would be some of these scribes copying out this manuscript. They may have seen, this is my blood of the covenant. And they realize that, that that's obviously referring to the old covenant where, you know, there's the circumcision and all that the covenant between God and Israel. Um, and they thought that doesn't quite fit with the Jesus narrative. So if I write the new covenant in there, if it just the insertion of that little word new, it can make things fit. So that that's a little bit of evidence of uh, scribal editing there when they, uh, when they put their manuscripts together. Okay, so where was I? Verse 25, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. All right, the Mount of Olives I'm going to include in, get in the Gethsemane portion of the, uh, of the show. So let's, uh, let's move on to Luke. All right, so the book of Luke, we're going to start in chapter 22, verse 1. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Oh, he gets his own section in this one instead of being just tapped onto the end of one. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called the Passover, so now that says called the Passover. One of um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, Jesus seems to be crucified on a different day, depending on which gospel you're reading. And uh, where that comes from is their references to the Passover and uh, di different parts of the Passover. Uh, now, one of the apologetics I've seen to try and correct that is they will say that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is different from the Passover. Uh, but in my Bible anyways, you know, NIV might be different in different versions. And like I said, I don't know the original language, but this version says the Feast of Unleavened Bread is called the Passover. So to me, that says it's the exact same, exact same festival or feast, whatever. <clears throat> anyway, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called the Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when, when no crowd was present. So you'll notice here that that's almost word for word a copy of um, what it said in Mark, which is one of the reasons why they think Mark was written first, is because all the other ones plagiarize Mark to death. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but this one, it like it copies word for word from Mark, but then it adds extra stuff in. So like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really make sense that, you know, G Judas, if he's been hanging out with Jesus for all this time and, you know, he's one of his loyal disciples, it doesn't make sense that just out of nowhere, Judas went and said, Hey, I'd like to betray my good friend over here. Um, so this one, attributes a motive to Judas. Uh, it, like it wasn't Judas acting on his own. It was Satan. Satan entered Judas and had Judas go betray, uh, betray Jesus. So let's move on to the last supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you to a large upper room all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things exactly as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Uh, that's interesting. That's kind of the similar line to him uh, not drinking wine anymore until he uh, enters the kingdom of God. 
Uh, this says he won't eat Passover again until he enters the kingdom, un until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So that's an interesting little difference there. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Okay, so that's, not, that's where that one went. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So this is the first one where he actually says to do something. So it, this, this is my hypothetical here. I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing... Um, you know, the, the four Gospels were probably written by competing uh, churches at the time, competing denominations of Christianity at the time. And uh, they, it seems like they all agreed that Mark was pretty much the truth, but it was too basic, so they had to add their own little flourishes in. And it looks to me like um, the, the people who wrote Luke, they already had a bit of a communion sort of ceremony going on, so they, they wrote this as the origin story of that. I don't know. That's, that's what it looks like to me. I might be wrong. Okay, so verse 20. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them might be who would do this. So that one, I don't know, it might say it later, but that one, it says woe to the man who betrays him, but it doesn't say it would be better that he had not ever been born. So perhaps the authors of Luke thought that that seemed a bit harsh, which I would agree with. Verse 24. Also a dispute rose among them as to which of them would, uh, was considered to be the greatest. They sound like a humble bunch. Well, I think I'm much more humble than you would understand. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you the kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Okay, that, that, okay, the whole thing about servers at the table, I guess that's just him saying that the, you know, the, the person who sits at the table is considered greater, but he, being God, is in a position of servitude, even though he's sitting at the table, he's not, he's not serving that. He might be, you know, the first one to get the bread and pass it around to them, but it doesn't look like he's actually in a serving position, but he's saying that he's serving at the table. He's not sitting at the table. He made it quite clear that he was reclining at it. Um, but anyway, verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. 34, Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Yeah, so so that's that's his prediction that Peter's going to deny Jesus later on in, uh, in the Gospels there. But it, it specifically says that Satan has asked to uh, sift, him, sift him as wheat. Uh, so it looks like that that kind of hails back to Job, I guess, where um, Satan is asking God, hey, can I, uh, can I test your guy here? You say he's pretty good. Let, let me test him. Um, and with, Jesus has prayed for him. So prayer is when you're supposed to be talking to God, but Jesus is God. I don't know. It seems seems a bit much to me, but yeah, it will deny him three times. Okay. Uh, so thirty five. Jesus asked them, "When I sent you with without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything?" Nothing. They answered. He told them, "But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. So sell the thing that's supposed to keep you warm, so that you can buy a weapon. This is gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Peace, peace, love, love. Buy a sword." So, yeah, for all the people saying Jesus wouldn't approve of the Second Amendment and the guns for duty, no, no, Jesus, depending on which version of Jesus you're looking at, he absolutely would have approved of all his followers being armed. Um, this is one of those examples. 
It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciple said, See, Lord, here there are two swords. That is enough, he replied. That actually sounds more like he doesn't want all his disciples to be armed, but that there was something specific that he had in mind, and having two swords would be enough for that. I... I don't get that. Like maybe, maybe there's something in Luke that gets skipped over in church often that I don't remember when I read it myself last. Um, but I, I, I can't think of anything that he tells them to do where they need swords for. Like I, I don't know. I don't get that verse. That just doesn't make it. It just out of nowhere he tells them to buy swords and then it just never comes up again. It's weird. Anywho, the next segment is the Mount of Olives. So uh, let's. Let's move on to Matthew's version of the Last Supper. All right, so on to the book of Matthew. Uh, This one starts at 26. It's got a couple extra sections, and it's in a little bit of a different order than the other ones, but let's, let's, uh, let's take a look. So 26 verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the place of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him, but not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. That was almost word for word. Uh, was in, I, I think that was Luke. I only just read it and I already forgot it. Okay, so through the magic of uh, editing, I managed to go look that up. It was actually in Mark. That, the, uh, that was closer to Mark than to Luke. Um, you remember Matthew and, uh, Matthew and Luke were written around the same time. They, was, some people actually think that Matthew might've been written before Luke, uh, but the majority seem to think that Matthew was written after, um, partly because there are things borrowed from Luke in Matthew, but it is mostly based on Mark. All, all three of the non-Mark gospels tend to be very heavily based on Mark. Um, so that, that was almost word for word right out of Mark, just a slightly different section. Jesus anointed at Bethany. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Again, almost word for word from Mark. Uh, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Again, you will not always have me. You will always have the poor. You will not always have me. I'm going to come back and be alive again and, you know, permanently with you in some spiritual form or bodily form, as some people believe. Well, as it seems to say in here, you resurrected bodily. So I'll be with you always, but... You will not always have me. Okay. Verse 12. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. It's kind of grim. I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Again, almost word for word right out of Mark. Now, Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Uh, Verse 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And again, that's almost word for word from Mark, but they added in a little bit of conversation there. It's not just a, oh, Judas Iscariot just out of nowhere decided to go betray Jesus and then was looking for an opportunity to hand him over. It, It provides some motivation aside from just one of Jesus' friends just randomly decided, hey, I'm going to betray this guy. It actually has him going and asking for money or for something like, hey, if you give me something for handing over Jesus, I'll do it. Provides motivation instead of just something random. Anywho, on to the Lord's Supper. Verse 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So again, this is happening on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That agrees with Mark. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? 
He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near, I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. So that one, that one's a little different. Uh, so it's differently worded. That one's not as obviously just lifted right from Mark. That one actually seems to have lost some detail. Uh, on to verse 20. When the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Again, almost word for word from Mark. 23. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. So that again, that goes almost word for word back to Mark. It would be better for him to have not been born. I've already said it twice. Should I say it again? That makes no fucking sense, God. Why would you punish the guy who made it possible for your great plan to come to fulfillment? Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Oh, he's telling them in this version. That's interesting. Uh, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke... Wait, wait, wait. He, he just told all of them, like, here are all my disciples, men who, like, we find out later, they're people who would fight for him. And he says, hey, this guy's sitting right here. He's gonna betray me. Now let's have some bread. And it just, and it just flows. Like, I think we're missing some details in there. Wonder if we'll fill that one in in John. Verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Insert yet another cannibalism joke here. That's disgusting, Jesus. Then he took the cup, uh, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. Again, it's got a little superscript there saying that some manuscripts say the new covenant. Um, at least this time he's warning them that it's his blood before they drink it. Uh, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, they added in the forgiveness of sins, but aside from that, that's almost word for word out of Mark. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. So implying that he's not going to have any more wine until the disciples are with him in his father's kingdom. That's that's interesting. I've never thought about that before because... Um, I, I don't recall specifically whether it's Matthew that says it, but I know at least one of them has him uh, drinking wine from a sponge uh, while he's on the cross. So that's definitely before the disciples were in heaven with him. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Okay, so that's Matthew's account of the Last Supper. Um, almost word for word, copied right out of Mark, except he added just a couple details here and there, changed the order of a couple things. Um, but yeah, like it's it's almost a direct it's it's like they didn't intend for these four stories to be read side by side. Like they were they like this the gospel according to Matthew is the book that this denomination uses. The gospel according to Luke is the book that this denomination uses. And you know, it seems to me like if if they ever read them side by side, they say, Oh, like those people following the gospel of Luke, they're heretical. Don't follow them. Follow us. We've got the true gospel, the gospel of Matthew. But anyway, on to John. Um, addendum. I just noticed, sorry, I said, I know I said we were going on to John, but I just realized that the uh, Jesus predicts Peter's denial, which we've covered um, at the Last Supper in the other ones, is uh, after they've gone to the Mount of Olives here. So um, I'm just going to read that bit since we've already done it in one of the other books. So Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Now, note there, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So this is, this is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
and they're having supper and then they go out to the Mount of Olives and he says, this very night you will disown me. So this is all happening on the same day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, on to the book of John. The book of John is a very long-winded book. So th this is the one that tries to fill in the most details. I feel like there's a lot of extra dialogue in John that nobody would have been able to witness except for the people who actually had the dialogue. Um, there's there's just there's just a whole lot extra in John, so I might skip some of it. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm going to start. The, they uh, they do it starts in chapter eleven, uh, verse forty five, with the plot to kill Jesus. Uh, basically, it's just Caiaphas and t saying how he was the high priest that year. Um, it, it gives them more. It gives them more motivation for actually wanting to kill Jesus. It suggests that um, you know if he keeps performing these miraculous deeds, then people are going to start believing him and following him, and then the Romans are going to come and take our temple away from us. And uh, you know, so for the good of Israel, we have to kill Jesus, and the act of killing Jesus will bring all Israel together. And so that's why the priests get together and try and you know actually find a way to kill Jesus. Um, Interestingly, though, you know, it comes to it later where um, Jesus says he was preaching publicly in the temple all the time. Um, in this one, we have chapter 11, verse 54. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. So, um, you know, I don't you know. Maybe it says somewhere else that uh, he changed his mind later. But... Um, Right there, it said that he was not in public preaching. He was hiding because he knew there was a plot out to, uh, to kill him. So I'm going to start at chapter 12. This is the Jesus anointed at Bethany story. Uh, six days before the Passover. Okay, for not, not even through the first sentence, we already have an issue. Because if we go back to Mark, Mark chapter 14 says, Now the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread were only two days away. This is saying it's six days before the Passover. Um, so it's, it's giving specific numbers and calling them both the Passover. So I don't know how you can reconcile that one, but so that's obviously a contradiction. Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Uh, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Okay, so that's, you know, same story, he's being anointed with perfume, uh, except instead of being in Simon the leper's house, he's with Lazarus, and instead of it just being some random woman breaking a jar of perfume over his face, which would be very uncomfortable, it's uh, Mary... Uh, I don't think it specifies which Mary, so let's, let's say Mary Magdalene, because that's the one that's usually portrayed in pop culture. Uh, so she took a pint of nard and uh, poured it on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The hair thing is a little bit weird, but uh, as someone who hates perfume, I'd much rather have it on my feet than on my face. So good for Mary. You know, she did, did, she did good. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, oh, it's providing more motivation for Judas, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Oh, they're giving Judas some extra motivation. So he he wants he wants some of the money from selling the nard, and he's... he's uh, it's a bit of a crooked bookkeeper. Uh, so given, given a bit more backstory, so it's not just suddenly this guy who's very close to Jesus just suddenly decided to betray him. This is someone who was pretending to be close to Jesus for the sake of making money. So even, even in Jesus' day, there were people pretending to be religious for extra money. At least according to this, I don't know. It, it seems like they're coming up with excuses to find out why someone who was supposedly so close to Jesus in the other stories would just, you know, suddenly turn like that. Like it, the other stories didn't really give much motivation. One of them attributed it to Satan. This is keeping it much more human where Judas is just greedy. He wants the money. 
Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So that's all four of the Gospels now say, you will always have the poor, but you will not always have me. So all four of the Gospels now agree, we will not always have Jesus. So stop saying Jesus is alive today, because according to the Gospels, he's not. He died. Sorry, correction. Three out of four of the Gospels have it. It's, uh... Uh, Luke is missing it. Mark, Matthew, and John all agree that Jesus will not always be with us. Um, I I have a feeling that was the one that it started in Mark, and it just uh, you know it, it came out, and they they nobody nobody really thought of the implications of that when they tacked on the resurrection story. Okay, so on to uh, we're in chapter twelve now, and we're at verse nine. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews out found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of his him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Next comes triumphal entry. Uh, He just pops in riding on a donkey's colt. Um... I'm skeptical the next little bit is, uh, you know, Jesus predicts his death. He just basically says, I'm going to, I'm going to die, but he does it in a long flowery poetic way. Uh, the Jews continue their unbelief. Can I skip that? Jesus watches his disciples feet. There's, there's some bits in here that are similar to uh, some of the other bits in the other story. So I'll, I'll read, uh, I'll read some of this one. It was just before the Passover feast. This is when we are now just before it doesn't say how many days, uh, time had come for him to leave the world, go to the Father. Okay, so this is chapter 13, verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. So, again, it's like even though this is the book that had the most understandable human motives for Jesus to or uh, sorry for Judas to be wanting to or for at least not being loyal to Jesus like he he's been established earlier as a greedy character he just wants money screw the perfume i want the money so i can buy shit for me um and so but it still feels the need to have the devil um prompt him to betray Jesus. It can't, it can't fathom even with his established shoddy character that, uh, you know, he would want to betray Jesus on his own. Okay. So I'm going to skip most of the feet washing stuff, but I like verse 10 here because, uh, he, uh, he's just offered to wash, uh, Simon Peter's feet. And Simon Peter said, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And verse 10, Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. I find that interesting. Every time Jesus gives hygienic advice in the Bible, he is wrong, like dead wrong. Like the, we, with the with the Pharisees, he told them, uh, I forget where this one is, but he uh, he tells them that you don't need to wash your dishes or your hands before you eat. Because, you know, what goes into your mouth, that's not going to hurt you. It's what comes out of your mouth that hurts you. You know, the stuff going in doesn't hurt you. Um, so clearly Jesus believed that the cause of disease was, uh, curses and such. So if you were profaning God or something, or like you're saying things that God didn't approve of, then you would end up with curses and that's what would cause your disease. And, you know, right here, he's saying, all you have to do is wash your feet. The rest of your body is clean. If you just wash your feet. Um, I, I don't agree with that. Like if you had chilies for lunch and then Taco Bell for dinner, uh, the next day you definitely need to wash more than just your feet just saying i think you can draw your own conclusions from that one i just i just found that one interesting on to jesus predicts his betrayal verse 18 i'm not referring to all of you i know those i have chosen but this is to fulfill the scripture he who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me i am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen you will believe that i am he I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. So that's that's just setting this up. You know, again, th- this book was written decades after, if, if these events actually happened, it was written decades after these events. So this person, and, and clear, the earlier book had none of these details. So clearly this person who wrote this down 
who said, I'm telling you now before it happens that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. Like Clearly, like, we can't know that that's what Jesus said. This guy had, there was no witnesses that he could talk to, to see that Jesus actually said that. So this is one of those prophecies that people are like, oh yeah, yeah, it's a fulfilled prophecy. See, Jesus predicted his own death. No, no, this is the same as saying the, the witches and Harry Potter predicted that Harry Potter would be the chosen one. Like, of course they did. It was written, like J.K. Rowling wrote it that way, or even, even like, you know, I predict that George Bush will win is George Bush Jr. will win his election and sit for two terms. I predicted that before he was elected. Are you going to believe me if I say that? Like, probably not. Um, yeah. So that, that's just, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Verse 21. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one of us he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one uh, to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. That's a big extrapolation from the earlier versions. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Did, did Satan have consent? I'm, I'm concerned that Judas is being raped by a devil. But yeah, again, it's attributing his actions to Satan. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. It, it really? How dumb do you guys have to be? He really just says, someone's going to betray me. It's the one who I give this piece of bread to. Then he gives the guy a piece of bread. The guy takes it and he says, what you're about to do, do quickly. And everybody they're like, oh, what's going on here? Hey, it, that, it's fucking clear. What's wrong with you guys? Verse 29, since Judas was in charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. These guys are idiots. Verse 30, as soon as Judas has taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Well, that's abrupt. Judas predicts Peter's denial. Verse 31, when, when he was gone, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and then God is glorified and if God is glorified, we'll glorify the son himself, glorify, gl yeah, that's a lot of glorify. Uh, 33, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me and just as I told the Jews, so I will tell you now. Are they not Jews? Well, I guess they're not the Jews. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, that's not a bad command. I mean, assuming he loved them well, and assuming that's not a sexual thing, that might be a sexual thing. I could see them, you know, hanging around with 12 dudes all the time, love everybody else as I have loved you. Chica chica. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Bow, chica, wow, wow. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Meaning I'm going to die and you'll die later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Okay. The next couple chapters of John are basically Jesus just, you know, Make, giving metaphors for his death and, you know, the spirit will be with you and stuff like that. And it, it um, gets to Gethsemane a little bit later. So I'm going to kind of leave it there. I just want to read this one section here. This is in chapter 15, verse 18, starting there. Uh, this section is called, The World Hates the Disciples. This is where the Christian persecution complex come from. One of the places. So verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, However, they have no excuse for the sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. Right, I'm skipping to verse 25. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Superscript B, that's from Psalm 35, 19. 
uh, and 69.4. So that's, I'm not going to look that up. Most of the Psalms are just King David saying how sucky his life is right now and how good God is or whatever. So, so it's probably just King David saying they hate me. So that little section there is like, that's, that's persecution complex, plain and simple. That's why Americans have such a hard time. Christian Americans, sorry, I should, I should specify that. That's why they have such a hard time with the fact that, you know, they three quarters of the nation identify as the same religion as them. 85% of, uh, I forget whether it's Congress. I think it's Congress. 85% of Congress are Christian of one sort or another. They are a majority Christian country whose Christian members always run around saying like, oh, they're persecuting us, poor us. They won't let us force Christian prayer into schools. They won't let us, you know, let us let counselors force gay conversion therapy on kids. You know, this is restriction of our freedom of speech. This is persecution, I tell you. No, it's not. It's not persecution. Also, the uh, forcing gay conversion therapy thing. Side note here, if you live in New York State, there is a uh, bill in the New York Senate right now, S-121. It's in the uh, New York Senate, and uh, it would make it illegal to perform sexual orientation change therapy on uh, patients under 18 years of age. So it would make it illegal to perform it on a minor. This is something that has gotten a lot of negative press recently um, from usually right-wing Christian evangelical nutjob websites. Sorry, you, you can be right-wing and not those other things, but uh, these, these people do happen to be right-wing. So sorry if you're conservative and I'm lumping you in with them. I, I'm not meaning you guys. I'm meaning the ones who are taking it to the extreme. Um, but yeah, so this, this bill has only gotten negative press from these guys. And, uh, it's, I, I think it's a great bill because like, firstly, there's actually an exemption for, uh, for clergy in there. So clergy are still allowed to perform, uh, orientation change efforts. That's what they call them. Um, which I think is garbage. I don't think anyone should be allowed to do it. But you know, so if you go and see this on one of the uh, the anti Bill S one twenty one websites, you'll see them saying, "Oh, this is restricting our freedom of speech. This is restrict you know, it's persecuting the Christian counselors." And it's like, yeah, but you can still take your kid to a clergy member to force them to change their orientation, which is ridiculous. But how can you possibly say that this is? persecuting Christians when it has a specific exemption for clergy. Um, but anywho, um, this, this bill has been hanging around in the Senate for the last couple of years. Um, it, it was uh, first brought to the table in uh, the 2015, 2016 legislative session. Uh, so if you go to the nysenate.gov website and uh, search there for S121, uh, you can, well, if you live in New York, you can let your rep representative know that you support this legislation and uh, hopefully we can get this passed. It, it, uh, they passed something similar in, at the county level in Erie County, but uh, it'd be, it'd be fantastic if it could be, uh, if it could be done statewide, like it'd be nice to set a precedent for that and make it so that you know, eventually uh, bring, make it so that uh, orientation change therapy is illegal across the country. I think that would be a wonderful thing. Maybe, maybe not the whole therapy be illegal, but like illegal to perform on minors. Oh, also something that gets glossed over a lot is this. Um, they'll say uh, I've I've heard it said that uh, you know going from gay to straight is bad, but going from straight to gay is encouraged. No, this this bill explicitly says that either way, doesn't matter which way you're going, gay to straight, straight to gay, doesn't matter. Both of them are illegal with this bill, which I agree with. So on that note, uh, this has been the first installment of my Easter session. Uh, maybe I'll get through the whole story. I don't know. The version in John is really friggin' huge. So Maybe I will, maybe I won't. If I don't, I'll continue it next Easter. If I do, I will. So thanks for stopping by. Remember to check me out on Twitter and Facebook, and you can also support me on Patreon should you choose to. See you next time.